In December of 2022, I found myself watching a lot of YouTube, as I tend to do when I'm on break from school, and naturally, since it was the end of the year, a lot of people were starting to put out videos on their top games of the year. I saw a lot of games getting tons of recognition, like Elden Ring, Kirby and the Forgotten Land, Stray, Pokemon Legends Arceus, Cult of the Lamb, Neon White, but there was one game I kept hoping that somebody, anybody, would mention. A game that flew under everyone's radar back when it was released in September. Freedom Planet 2. But not only did I not see anybody discussing it in terms of what made their Game of the Year lists, I barely saw anybody discussing it at all. Searching it up on YouTube, the only review that comes up in the first few results is from Some Call Me Johnny, and the others are all from relatively small channels. And this absolutely baffled me, because after picking Freedom Planet 2 up when it launched, even with Splatoon 3 having come out just a few days earlier, I absolutely couldn't put this game down. No matter what I did, it just kept sucking me back in, and after my first playthrough, I knew that I had to talk about it here on the channel. So I set about playing through nearly every aspect of the game, recording all of my footage along the way. But I knew that I'd have to talk about the first Freedom Planet game in order to contextualize this video, so I made a review of that as well, which I'll put a link to in the top right corner and the description. And now, finally, almost six months after I started recording footage, I'm here writing the script for this video. It's been a long process, as I've gotten distracted by making other videos, going back and forth between home and school, finishing one semester and starting another, and now it's finally time to talk about Freedom Planet 2, which might honestly be my favorite 2D platformer of all time. So without any further introduction, let's get into this. As you may remember from my first Freedom Planet video, my history with the series goes way back to my middle school years. I picked up the first game in 2015 on my Wii U, and just a couple of months later, Galaxy Trail dropped the first cinematic trailer for its sequel. This gorgeous, fully animated trailer set up the premise for the game's new antagonist, Murga, and my younger self could not have been more excited for the game. And over the next few years, the devs would occasionally drip feed information in the form of new trailers, the first of which being gameplay trailers for each of the returning characters, showcasing changes in their gameplay styles and new designs to match the game's new 32-bit art style, as well as revealing that Nira Lee, a boss character from the first game, would be playable too. Eventually, a sample version of the game's first stage, a new and improved Dragon Valley, was released, and from then on, information about the game was extremely slow. While it was originally intended to release in 2019, Freedom Planet 2 ended up getting delayed repeatedly, which, according to the game's lead designer, Sabrina Daduro, was mainly because the team just kept having more and more ideas they wanted to implement. Which, I mean, seeing the final product now, it seems like it was absolutely worth it. In August of 2022, they finally announced that the game would be releasing... four days after Splatoon 3. I feel like this is the reason Freedom Planet 2 went under most people's radars. Not only were updates infrequent and small between 2019 and the release, but it was now going to be coming out just a few days after the biggest Nintendo game releasing that year. And a lot of Freedom Planet's fanbase consists of Nintendo fans. There's a reason why the original game's first console port was on the Wii U, of all systems. I don't fault Galaxy Trail for this at all, of course. I doubt they knew when they announced the game that it would be nearly seven years before they were able to actually release it. But it doesn't change the fact that the game was revealed way too early, and indefinitely suffered because of that. Freedom Planet was huge in 2014 and 2015, being heralded as one of the best indie games of the time, but Freedom Planet 2 lost a lot of that steam simply due to how long it took to come out. Right now, the game is only available on PC, but it'll be making the leap to all current consoles this summer, and I sincerely hope that helps it reach a wider audience. With all that said, I'm going to be discussing the game's story first, as not only do I think it's one of the areas that improved the most from the first game, but it's also part of what made me fall in love with Freedom Planet 2 so much in the first place. I'll give a warning before I start discussing major spoilers, so don't worry if you're trying to go in blind. Freedom Planet 2 takes place three years after the events of the first game, with Brevin having been chased off planet, Torque leaving Avalis to pursue him, and the Kingdom Stone having been shattered. In this time, our three heroes from the first game have been honing their skills in their own ways, fending off the occasional attacks from mutants or robots left behind by Bremen's army. Eventually, though, they are summoned by Nira Lee to an audience with the Magister of Shang-2, where he tasks them with investigating the various goings-on throughout the Three Kingdoms, eventually unveiling a larger conspiracy that threatens all of Avalis once again. The game is split into two distinct acts, with each containing an interest stage or two, followed by three episodes, each containing a smaller story spread across a few stages, and that eventually ties into the overarching narrative. These can be done in any order within the act, allowing for a fair bit of variety on repeat playthroughs, as you're able to customize and mix up the order you tackle the stages in. 
Finally, each act is capped off by a climactic gauntlet of stages, leading to more major progression in the story. Now, like Freedom Planet 1, there are some minor story differences based on the character you're playing as. However, these differences are relatively minor, and mainly relate to each character's personal arc. However, unlike the first game, each character plays through the exact same stages, so there are no longer any stages like Aqua Tunnel or Pangu Lagoon that are exclusive to certain characters. There is, however, a secret true ending if you collect all the time capsules introduced in the game's second act, which I highly recommend doing as it makes an already great story even better. In terms of tonal consistency and characterization, Freedom Planet 2 blows the first game out of the water. Whereas Freedom Planet 1 struggled to balance its more serious moments with comedic and lighthearted ones, this game finds a perfect balance between the two, still having its wholesome and funny moments, while also knowing when to take itself seriously, and not exaggerating either to the point of annoyance. If I had to compare it to anything, I'd compare it to Avatar The Last Airbender, in the way it handles some very mature subject matter with expert nuance and grace, while still being something that children and adults alike can enjoy. The game introduces a few new characters too, and they're all incredibly worthwhile additions to the cast. Some of the highlights being Corazon, Carol's estranged mercenary sister and captain of the airship Saguada, Captain Kala, a self-proclaimed hero with an overinflated ego, who also happens to be the champion of Shang Mu's battle sphere, and of course, the game's main antagonist, Murga, the water dragon's last centurion, who was sealed away in a time of war and released when the Kingdom Stone was destroyed. They all help to flesh out the world of Avalis and contribute to the overarching story in some really creative and entertaining ways. The entire voice cast from the first Freedom Planet also makes a return, excluding PM Seymour as Torque and Xander Borrega as Brevin since they're not present for the story. Don M. Bennett returns as Lilac better than ever and seriously knocks it out of the park, Amanda Lott is back as Carol with the same snarky attitude as ever, and Amy Smith brings a new side to Mila that just makes me adore her character even more. Ashlyn Madden also returns as Nira Lee, and brings a new, softer quality to the character's voice that really helps to flesh her out more. All of the returning cast completely outdoes their performances from the first game, and the newcomers mesh excellently with the rest. Some standouts overall for me were Jason Lord as Serpentine and Josh Grell as Captain Kala, who both never failed to get a laugh out of me whenever they showed up. And finally, Morgan Berry as Murga, whose performance only helped skyrocket her to becoming my favorite character in the entire game. There is one performance I wasn't a huge fan of, though, and that's Lindsay Jones as Corey. It's not to say that she doesn't do a good job, because she does! During the calmer scenes, she does a great job portraying Corey. It's just that during the more intense scenes, her voice tends to become a bit out of character. And if you're familiar with her other voice work, you'll probably recognize this voice. Yeah, Jones is most well known as Ruby Rose in Ruby, and there are definitely times when you can hear her slip out of the voice she uses for Corey and into Ruby's voice. She's a great voice actor when it comes to Ruby, but this voice doesn't really fit Corazon all that well, at least in my opinion. But with all that said, I think it's time to finally get into the spoiler section of this video, so if you want to avoid that, skip to the timestamp on screen or in the video's description. I've made some funky little chapter markers just to help you all out. With all that said, spoilers start in 3, 2, 1. I'm going to start by talking about the expansive lore of the main story, and the implications it has on Murga. See, about halfway through the game, it's revealed that the Earth Dragons, who were previously established to have come from another world, actually enslaved the native water dragons, forcing them to repair their ship, Bakunawa. However, the water dragons began to rebel, and in retaliation, the earth dragons wiped out numerous water dragon villages during a supposed test fire of Bakunawa's mining laser. Naturally, this only angered the water dragons further, and an all-out war erupted, with the water dragons eventually using their vast knowledge and history of genetic experimentation to create a champion capable of driving off their oppressors, Murga. Much of this is revealed in the main story itself, but is further detailed in the time capsules, the first of which can be found in one of the hub worlds at the start of Act 2, and the rest by completing specific challenges in the Battle Sphere. Collecting all of them unlocks the secret final boss and the true ending. These time capsules are the video diaries of Cordelia, an Earth Dragon princess who lived during the war, starting off as largely oblivious to the abuse of the Water Dragons despite having some as servants herself, Cordelia eventually begins to realize what's actually going on, and leaves the palace in an attempt to make peace with the Water Dragons. Naturally, she's captured and held hostage for a non-specific amount of time, but it's implied to be for quite a while. During this time, she gets to know Murga very personally, and we get to see a lot of Murga's struggles even amongst her own people. Despite being created specifically to protect them, many of the water dragons are deathly afraid of Murga, viewing her as a bloodthirsty monster rather than a person, with Cordelia being the first person to truly see her for herself, well, the two naturally fell deeply in love. 
Of course, the story doesn't have a happy ending. Cordelia's final entry tells of how she convinced the Water Dragon and Earth Dragon leaders to negotiate peace, and as we find out later in the main story, the Earth Dragons betrayed their trust, wiping out nearly all of the Water Dragons and sealing Murga away with the power of the Kingdom Stone. These time capsules almost single-handedly make Murga one of my favorite characters in the game. Despite her not directly appearing in any of the entries, it builds up her motivations and character so much more, and makes her agony and rage so much more understandable. For Murga to finally have been so deeply understood by someone, only to have it ripped away, and the people she was made to protect massacred, it's natural, though not justified, that her first thought would be to take revenge on anyone she felt was responsible, that being the Earth Dragons in the kingdom they built on the Water Dragons' graves. This background helps contextualize Lilac's main arc throughout the story, as much of it focused on the relationship between her and Murga. While each of the other protagonists have an arc with one or two other characters, usually one of Murga's associates, Lilac's story is focused almost entirely on her learning the truth of what happened to the Water Dragons, and giving her a reason to continue fighting for peace. There are some really great moments of character building at critical points in the story, with Lilac even questioning if what she's really doing is right, all while Murga tries to convince her to change sides and leave Avalis with her. And not only does this storyline contain some of the most emotionally impactful scenes in the game, but these are further enhanced by the phenomenal voice acting from both Don Bennett and Morgan Berry. Our past, our history, they're nothing but chains, and we are choking on them! No! The Earth Dragons must suffer! The Water Dragons will have justice! I will have my revenge! Moving on to the other protagonists, Carol's arc is the second biggest in the game, and it revolves around her trying to convince her sister Corazon to stop working for Murga. Throughout the game, Cory constantly evades her sister's pursuit, insisting that she's doing this for Carol's own good. Eventually, after Murga's forces take Shang Tu, Carol parts ways with the rest of the team, heading to the island nation of Perusa to track her sister down, with the others following behind in order to locate Carol. This is a really interesting narrative split for Carol, and leads to a ton of wholly unique scenes that only appear in her route. Despite playing the same levels and having the same episodic story structure as the others, Spade makes contact with Carol after reaching Perusa, and he provides most of her support during her missions on the continent. However, this does introduce a bit of a plot hole, since Spade also works with the other three protagonists during their time in Perusa. Since he knew they were looking for Carol, why didn't he just tell the others where she was? Then again, considering Spade isn't the most trustworthy individual, it's possible this was intentional on his part. During the game's final gauntlet of stages, Carol and Cory have one final confrontation, with Cory revealing that she made a deal with Murga for her and Carol to flee Avalis safely aboard Bakunawa once Murga's plans were complete. Which would have been a lot more impactful if we as the players hadn't been told this as soon as we learned Cory was working with Murga. I mean, sure, there were enough hints that this was the case even in her normal dialogue with Carol, but the fact that we learned this immediately after Cory was introduced took away a lot of the potential impact. Actually, now that I think about it, this was a common problem with some of the game's story. A few things that could have been played up for intrigue, or used to surprise the player later in the game, are given away before they can have any real impact. Cory having a deal with Murga to protect Carol, Captain Kala's true loyalties lying with Murga. There were a lot of things they handled well in this regard, like the details of Murga's history and the reveal of Escal being a double agent, but there are just a few that could have been handled better. Anyways, back with Carol and Cory, they're forced to come to blows with Carol of course coming out on top, but at the last second, Murga swoops in and deals a near fatal blow to Cory. This is a story beat I felt was almost entirely unnecessary, as it undermines a lot of Murga's character up until this point, and is immediately resolved by Mila being able to heal Cory in the next cutscene. This feels like something that was left over from an earlier draft of the script that they just forgot to take out especially since it only appears in Carol's route, despite every other character fighting Cory during this scene. Mila and Nira's stories are a lot smaller in scope than Lilac and Carol's were, but that doesn't mean they're any less enjoyable. In Mila's case, throughout the story, the heroes repeatedly encounter General Serpentine, one of Brevin's commanders from the previous game, who was left behind when he fled the planet. With each of these encounters, Serpentine reveals further information about Mila's origins, eventually revealing to her that she's originally from Brevin's homeworld, bred as a war dog. Using this as leverage, Mila makes a deal with Serpentine to betray her friends in exchange for him helping her find her parents. But naturally, she double-crosses him when he attempts to take over Bakanawa. If you're playing as Mila, there's this really cool exclusive scene of Serpentine using syntax to try and control Mila, with her eventually breaking free and fighting back against him, with that being the end of her arc. Overall, it's a very simple and satisfying story, and seeing as she was the first character I played as, 
It helped me appreciate both the core main story as well as her fairly separate arc. Finally, we have Nira's story. While the other characters' arcs were shown mostly through exclusive scenes you'd only see by playing as those characters, Nira's is told mostly during the main story events, and her focus is on learning to trust in her allies. She starts off taking full charge of the group in just about every situation, operating using force wherever necessary. And this slowly grows throughout the first set of episodes, reaching a boiling point when Ascal betrays Shang Tu, and the heroes are driven out of the kingdom by Murga's forces. Naturally, as a soldier with intense dedication to her kingdom, this shook Nira to her core, and was only worsened when Carol snuck out in search of Cory. However, throughout the events of the game's second act, Nira slowly learns to trust in her allies once more, and gets to confront Ascal about his actions in one of her few exclusive scenes. I do have some pretty major issues with this scene, though, as it greatly undermines Ascal's character as he's been presented up until this point. Up until now, he's been shown as being dedicated to whatever he feels is just, holding the Magister responsible for covering up the truth of what happened to the Water Dragons. But just before his boss battle with Nira, he suddenly does this. But it doesn't have to be that way anymore. Excuse me? Not only does this come out of nowhere with next to no buildup in any previous scene, but it also paints Ascal as a misogynist, with him defining a woman's importance by her attachment to a man, in Nira's case, the Magister. And it's a shame, because up until then, Ascal had been a really interesting antagonist, but this scene takes away a lot of what made him interesting to me. In any case, the rest of the story plays out fairly similar to the other characters, up until the very ending, where the Magister steps down as ruler of Shang Tu, and for her dedication to the kingdom, he names Nira the temporary regent until proper elections can be held, solidly closing out her arc. There are a few other characters with notable arcs, such as the Magister being forced to confront the actions of his grandfather, who ruled Shang Tu during the Dragon Wars, and attempting to figure out his place in the conflict. Captain Kala has some surprising depth to him as well, and though this is mostly relegated to one scene at the end of Skybridge, where we learn his true motivations behind joining Murga, it does wonders for his character and makes him a love-to-hate antagonist. Ah borders on the edge of being annoying and endearing at times, but in the end I like the chaotic energy he brought to a lot of the storyline especially the Robot Wars episode. And finally, General Serpentine was a fantastic comedic villain, whose involvement in the story really helps enhance the overall themes of the game's final act. Speaking of which, it's finally time to talk about the game's finale. During the final gauntlet of stages, Murga launches the Bakanawa, with the intent of using its mining laser to destroy the moon, both fueling the ship enough for her to escape the solar system, and spelling the end of Avalis in the process. The heroes hitch a ride with Serpentine, thanks to Mila's deception, and begin their raid of Bakunawa, taking on most of Murga's forces in the process. Though just before they're able to reach the Dragoness herself, Serpentine uses Syntax's Code Black, taking control of the ship and all of Murga's forces, until... Well, no matter! With Code Black installed, I can simply flood this chamber with my robots! Then we'll see who has the last l- No! No! What happened?! Huh, surely that won't be important later. Anyways, once the crew reaches Murga, they engage in one final battle against her after the Magister's negotiations fail. Murga's boss is easily the most difficult in the game, having a full six phases, with the first five being based on different forms of the moon, which background texts in the hub worlds reveal were culturally important to the water dragons. Once the heroes prevail, though, is where the story diverges. Now, normally, this scene will end with Bakanawa crashing into Avalis, and Murga seemingly disappearing in the wreckage. However, if the player collects all of the time capsules, Murga's shouting is interrupted by one final message from Cordelia. Though heavily corrupted, the general message comes across just fine, with Cordelia's final wish being for Murga to find her own happiness. And Murga is barely given time to process this before they're interrupted by Syntax, Serpentine's AI. Syntax has completely integrated itself into the ship thanks to Code Black, and is now charging up the mining laser to devour the moon, leading to one final mad dash to stop it. And the theming here is some of the best in the game, with Syntax's distant eye on a haunting pitch black background, the pause menu taunting you with a message of you can't hide here, and much more. The heroes encounter Syntax fused with the ship's core, dubbed in the arena as Bakanawa Fusion, and team up with Murga to defeat it and save Avalis. Overall, the final part of this story gives heavy vibes of the ending of a 2000s era Sonic game. With Eggman having messed with powers beyond his understanding, he's forced to team up with the heroes to clean up his own mess. However, because the game has spent so much time building up Murga's character, it makes her willingness to help an incredibly fulfilling end to her character arc. And though she disappears at the end of the game, it's heavily implied that she survives Bakunawa's wreckage. And don't think I didn't notice the little tease of Breva's return there at the end. 
One of the core themes of Freedom Planet 2's story is that we'll always be affected by the actions of those who came before us, but what we do in the face of that knowledge, how we learn, grow, and change the world around us, is what really matters in the end, which is an extremely deep and relevant theme, especially in today's world. For Murga, her first instinct was to take revenge against the people who wronged her, but in the end, she acknowledges the error of her ways, and is allowed to grieve in peace. Lilac, Carol, and Mila don't allow themselves to be defined by the circumstances of their past, whether that be as the last survivor of a dying race, a former thief, or a soldier bred for war. Nira moves past the betrayals she suffered, and allows herself to do the best she can for her people. The Magister confronts the corruption of his own lineage, and takes the first steps to atoning for the wrongdoings of his ancestors. And despite the remnants of bloodshed and chaos, the lingering memory of the trauma inflicted on them all by Brevin and his army, they stand ready to do their part in defending and bettering the world. And on that note, there's one last scene after the game's credits roll, revealing Cordelia's final message in full, and also that she's been alive this whole time? I swear to god, if she doesn't have a damn good reason for not running to her wife the moment she was freed, I'm gonna lose my shit. Anyways, that's it for the spoiler section. And hey, if you're still with me and you like what you've seen so far, why not subscribe to the channel so you don't miss my future uploads? Once this video goes up, I'll be starting work on a review of Punch Out for the Wii, and I also stream sometimes, so subscribe if you don't want to miss any of that. Liking and commenting also helps out a ton since it gives the video a boost in the YouTube algorithm and shows it to even more people. Thanks a ton. Now, as for the gameplay, Freedom Planet 2 borrows a lot from its predecessor, but also adds to it, as you would expect from a sequel. Whereas Freedom Planet 1's movement was fairly rigid and precise, this game has a lot more flow to it, allowing many more attacks and movements to be chained together in creative ways. Each returning character's moveset has been refined, keeping the best from the original game while adding new aspects that work to make up for their weaknesses. Lilac has changed the least from her original incarnation, still sporting her trademark Dragon Boost and Cyclone, allowing her to blaze through stages at high speeds. New to her moveset is the Dragon Burst, allowing you to cancel out of your Dragon Boost early and leave a damaging spark behind you. This move is extremely useful in boss fights, and I actually didn't even know this move existed until my second playthrough with her, which made the first one way harder than it needed to be. Additionally, every character now has the ability to guard, granting a few frames of invulnerability to all attacks with the press of a button, and each character has an additional unique ability tied to guarding. For Lilac, this is the Blink Dash. By pressing the guard button twice in quick succession, Lilac will dash forward a bit while keeping the invulnerability of her guard allowing her to dodge attacks from enemies much more quickly than she would otherwise. Carol, meanwhile, has had a lot more significant changes to her moveset, making her equally suited for speed and combat. Carol still has access to her motorcycle upon grabbing a fuel tank, which is as great of a boon as it ever was, and she also keeps most of her standard claw attacks and pounce. She's also been given different aerial attacks based on what direction you hold when inputting them, which grants her a lot more variety and utility than she had previously but perhaps the most important addition to Carol's moveset is the Jump Disc, replacing her old Wildcat Kick special from the first game. When Carol throws the Jump Disc, it hones onto the nearest enemy or destructible item in the direction it's thrown, and if Carol presses the button again, she'll leap toward the Jump Disc with brief invulnerability. Not only is this a massive help with precise platforming, something Carol struggled with a bit in the first game, but it also provides her a much needed in when fighting larger enemies and bosses. Since most of Carol's attacks are short range, the jump disc helps her to close the gap between her and an enemy's weak spot without as much of a risk of taking damage, the same kind of effect that Lilac's Dragon Boost has and Carol's Wildcat Kick lacked in the first game. If Carol's riding her motorcycle, she'll throw it instead of the jump disc, and afterward it'll be put in the void. The player can take their motorcycle back out by throwing the jump disc, and instead of pressing the special button to jump to the disc, pressing the guard button. This solves another issue I had with Carol in the first game, that being not having an easy way to get off her motorcycle. Sure, you could stand still and press down, but this also meant if you wanted to get the motorcycle back, you'd have to either find another fuel tank or come back here. And there were a lot of times I would rather not have used Carol's motorcycle in the first game, since it's not really suited for combat against larger enemies or bosses. But Freedom Planet 2 fixed that by tying it to the jump disc ability in a really smart way. Overall, the changes made to Carol's moveset had made her skyrocket from being my least favorite character to play as in the first game, to being my absolute favorite in this one. Mila's probably the character who changed the most since the first game, and while she's still primarily intended for exploration, she's now able to hold her own a lot better in combat. She still has her trademark flutter jump and the ability to summon cubes, though the latter is now tied to her guard ability. She's also able to access her whole moveset when she has a cube, as instead of carrying it, the cube now floats behind her. Mila's trademark shield burst is still intact, 
now aimable in 8 directions rather than just 6, but the cubes have even more utility now. See, the shield burst and the actual shield itself are now tied to separate buttons, and while the shield is as useful as ever, releasing the button now fires small projectiles that slowly eat away at the cube. The smaller the cube is, the less powerful both your shield burst and cube blaster become. So it's essential to guard frequently to have a full cube whenever you can. All in all, Mila is much more fun to control in this game, while still retaining most of the aspects that made her unique in the first one. And finally, we have this game's completely new playable character, Mira Lee. She's the slowest character in the game, but her attacks dish out the most damage by far. Most of her attacks are tied to her frost lands, allowing her to spin it over her head, create a burst of ice directly in front of her by slamming it into the ground, or fire short-range ice projectiles from its point. Her special takes the form of various frost arts, which, based on the direction held, allow her to shoot projectiles that freeze enemies on contact, fire a torrent of icy wind directly above her, or create ice pillars that damage enemies and act as an additional platform for Nera. Her guard ability is Focus, increasing the speed of her attacks and allowing her to dish out damage even faster for a limited time. The biggest issue with Nera is her traversal options, or lack thereof. It's not her speed that's an issue, it's her vertical mobility. Nera has a double jump, but this doesn't help the fact that most vertical platforming sections are unnecessarily difficult for Nera, and sometimes outright impossible without coming to a complete stop to figure out a way up. There are some workarounds, such as freezing enemies to use them as platforms, or abusing the very slight increase in height granted by her upward frost art, but these make Nera very unsatisfying to play as in vertical sections. They don't feel like they were designed with Nera in mind, and I think that if her jumps had just a little more height, this would be far less frustrating. Despite this, Nero was fairly fun to play as, especially in boss fights, where she quickly tore through some of the ones I'd struggle with the most in my other playthroughs. Now that we've discussed all the characters, I should talk about the general gameplay and stage design, which has seen a lot of changes. First off, the stage gimmicks of each level are a lot more prominent, helping every stage to feel much more unique, such as the Vine Pillars in Dragon Valley, Airship's Iguata's Key Blocks, and Robot Graveyard's Giant Magnets. Some of these mechanics may show up in later stages, but most of them remain exclusive to just one or two, helping keep them fresh each time they appear. Further contributing to this sense of uniqueness is the actual design of the levels themselves, which is different in almost every single stage. Dragon Valley is similar in design to many Freedom Planet 1 stages, helping the player get used to this game's new mechanics, while Avian Museum is much more clustered, focusing more on platforming quickly at risk of being crushed. Stages like Phoenix Highway and Bakanawa Rush are much more open and focused on pure speed, and there are others with wholly unique concepts. Gravity Bubble takes place almost entirely underwater, and poses an extremely interesting challenge with the game's swimming mechanics, and Lightning Tower, which is one of my personal favorite stages, takes place entirely inside of a vertical shaft, which slowly becomes more claustrophobic as you make your way to the top solving puzzles. Of course, the most unique stage by far is the Battle Sphere. Rather than being a straightforward get to the goal stage, the Battle Sphere features a ton of smaller scale challenges, such as defeating waves of enemies, racing to the end of a specially designed course, or even facing unique bosses exclusive to this stage. Only a couple of these are required for story progression, but the Battle Sphere can be revisited at just about any point in the game to complete the rest of its numerous challenges, some of which grant the aforementioned time capsules necessary to get the true ending. Overall, the stage design is much more varied than the first game, which makes replaying them all the more enjoyable. This is essential, not only since Freedom Planet 2 features a whopping 24 regular stages, nearly twice as many as the first game, but also because it places a lot of emphasis on replayability. In addition to each of the four characters offering a different experience, the game now features a ranking system. Though, unlike what you might expect, these rankings aren't based on how quickly you get through the stage. They're actually based on the equipable items you're using, which change the game's difficulty. Rather than having a traditional difficulty setting, Freedom Planet 2 starts off by giving you a choice of easy, normal, and hard, with each option giving you different starting items. For easy mode, you're given items that give you various buffs at the cost of decreasing your crystal bonus. Normal mode gives you no items, and hard mode supplies a few challenge modifiers that increase your crystal bonus if you manage to beat the stage with them. More of these items can be found in chests in some of the earlier stages, or bought from the shops in the game's various hub worlds. Your rank is determined by your overall crystal bonus at the end of the stage, which is determined by what items you're using and how many times you died. An S rank requires you use two challenge modifiers, plus finish the stage without dying. Thankfully, there are a ton of options to choose from when it comes to these modifiers, ranging from double damage, to finishing the stage within a time limit, or changing all the item containers into bombs. This difficulty can be mitigated by your potions, which are special items you can buy from Mila's laboratory. 
These items provide overall minor buffs, such as slightly increasing your jump height or speed, allowing shields to take an additional hit, or making your attacks have a small chance to heal you the same amount of damage you dealt. You can mix and match up to 5 potion effects at once, with duplicates being fair game, allowing a great deal of further customization. Your potion also has no effect on your crystal bonus, allowing you to make up for the banes given to you by the challenge modifiers. There is a hidden rank that provides one of the game's greatest challenges though, and that's the Rainbow S rank. The only way to get this rank is by using the one-hit KO challenge modifier, plus an extra challenge modifier and finishing the stage without dying. I've only managed to get this rank on the first few stages, and it's no joke. What I found most effective is to apply no revivals as your second modifier, since you already have to avoid dying anyways, and then just max out your potion jar with the shield potion. See, elemental shields don't count toward the one-hit KO, so by applying these, every elemental shield counts for 7 hits rather than 2. Not to mention, any remaining hits you have when you collect a new shield stack, so as long as you know the quickest way to get shields in a stage, you can abuse them in order to break through this challenge and get that coveted Rainbow S. This particular potion is also extremely useful when it comes to the bosses, and this is another place that Freedom Planet 2 shines. While the first game had generally good boss design, with a few extremely frustrating ones, this game's bosses walk the line between fairness and difficulty expertly, which is no doubt helped by the customizable difficulty. Each boss starts out fairly tough, even the ones early in the game, but they slowly become more doable as you watch their attack patterns and figure out when you can attack without getting damaged. Just like the first game, there's a wide size variety in the bosses, with some towering over the player, and others being the exact same size, leading to a variety of different strategies you can deploy for each of them. Additionally, the actual boss arenas are much more varied this time, forcing you to take the environment into account for each fight. Unfortunately, I can't show you too many of my favorite bosses, since many of them are heavy in spoiler territory, but without saying too much, my favorite bosses are from Robot Graveyard, Diamond Point, Clockwork Arboretum, and both the normal and true final bosses. There are a few other minor changes to the gameplay, such as the removal of star cards as collectibles from the first game. In their place are chests containing either bravestones that modify the difficulty or, more commonly, vinyls with the stage's music in them. Additionally, the various elemental shields have been slightly reworked, now taking the form of sprites. Their effects are generally the same as the first game, with most attacks having some kind of element that the player becomes immune to when equipped with the proper shield. I did notice that generally, the attacks of enemies were easier to guess than the first game, which addresses one of my earlier complaints. And as I mentioned, the amount of hits left on a shield will stack when grabbing another one, further enhancing their utility. Finally, one of the last major changes is how the life system works. Your extra lives do not carry over between stages, instead starting you off with a set amount at the beginning of every stage, and just like the first game, awarding you with an extra stock when you collect a certain number of crystals. However, the biggest change comes when you actually die. So long as the character's body remains intact after the death animation, you're given the choice of either restarting from the last checkpoint, or reviving immediately with a small amount of health. This is a godsend in some of the harder bosses, as if you die right before you could defeat a boss, this gives you a second chance. I'm a huge fan of this reworked system, as it gives the player more freedom in how they tackle the challenges presented, and makes it less likely the player will rage quit because they died when a boss was almost defeated. In terms of other things the game adds to the mix, Freedom Planet 2 features fully explorable hub worlds with a variety of NPCs to interact with. Many of them have dialogue relating to the current situation in the game's story, and it'll actually change based on when you speak to them. Additionally, there are various shops set up in each area where you can buy brave stones and vinyls, which you can then take to Verse, one of my personal favorite NPCs, to have them played. I wish the music kept playing when you left to explore the hub world instead of forcing you to stay on that menu, but a music player is always a welcome inclusion. I mean, it's not like I made an entire video about why Splatoon needed one and then they added it in an update, but some of the characters in the hub are an absolute joy to interact with, and actually serve to build up the lore of the world in a really interesting way. This no longer feels like just the setting to a big globetrotting adventure like the first game did. It feels like a living, breathing world, and the NPCs interact realistically to the various happenings of the plot, especially considering the scale of some of the events. Some of my personal favorite NPCs are Verse, because... Um, of course she is. Sunny and Amelia, who are clear parodies of Sonic and Amy, and make constant references to their home series. And Maria Note, a news reporter who has some very fun dialogue as she tries to convince the heroes to do an interview with her. And finally, let's cap this review off with one of my absolute favorite parts of the game. The soundtrack. This has honestly been one of the biggest aspects pushing me to complete this review, and even though I'm only going to talk about it for a little bit, it's probably the single aspect of the game that's impacted me the most. The soundtrack is hands down one of the best I've ever heard for a game. 
It didn't stand out to me all that much on my first playthrough, but as I continued to sit on it and kept playing through more of the game to gather footage, every time more and more tracks stood out to me. They also make fantastic use of leitmotifs to thematically link locations and characters, such as Robot Graveyard featuring Brevin's leitmotif, since it's the remains of Battle Glacier from the first game, as well as a lot of Mila's character theme and shop music featuring parts of Relic Maze, and Lilac's theme featuring bits of Pangu Lagoon. From the high-energy stage music to the emotionally driven boss themes, and even the cutscene tracks, I don't think there's a single song in this game that misses. I have too many favorites to count, but if I had to pick just a few, it'd probably be Lightning Tower, Airship Saguata, and Inversion Dynamo. But don't just take my word for it. Go listen to the soundtrack for yourself, because Galaxy Trail has graciously uploaded all of the stage music to their official YouTube channel, and the full soundtrack is for sale on Bandcamp. Here's a few brief highlights from the songs if you need just a little more encouragement. All I can do, though, is extend a massive thank you to all of the lovely people who contributed to this game's soundtrack, because it's essentially become the soundtrack to my life, as I constantly put it on whenever I'm walking around campus, or driving, or even working on videos like this one. This is genuinely the best game soundtrack I've ever heard, at least as of yet, and that is some tough competition with games like Splatoon, The First Freedom Planet, Sonic Mania, Persona 5. With all of that said, though, that just about wraps up my thoughts on Freedom Planet 2. I cannot recommend this game enough, so if you're a fan of 2D platformers by any stretch of the term, this game is an absolute must-play. And honestly, I don't even think the first game is required reading to play this one, though I'd still recommend you check it out. The game is currently available on Steam and Itch.io for only 25 bucks, which is an absolute steal for as high quality of a game as this is. And hopefully, when the game launches on consoles later this summer, it'll get more of the recognition it deserves. Once again, Thanks to everyone at Galaxy Trail for creating such an incredible experience. I can't wait to see where you guys go next. <laughs>